Hello everybody, welcome to Eddie Dreams. Today I have something so special to share with you. This marks the first episode of the video audio series for the Career Curious We Explore the Lives You Could Have. And today we're speaking with Dr. Fabio Mattioli. He is an anthropologist and senior lecturer at the University of Melbourne who has managed to go through Italy, France and the United States just in the endeavor of getting a PhD and degree. And this is only the start of his misadventures. I am so excited for this. Dr. Fabioli, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Michael, for having me. <laughs> yes, no worries. So just to start again, thanks so much for being here. I've been really excited to get into this because I think that what um, our audience here wants to know and what you've been studying recently are in line. I saw you publish a journal article about practice-based learning in universities. I'm extremely curious about that. Could you tell us a bit about it? What were the most significant findings? And sure. Yeah. Yeah, this is a, a subject that I've developed in the past couple of years since moving here to the University of Melbourne. It's a subject where our students are paired with uh, other partners that are um, either students that are studying entrepreneurship and doing a master of entrepreneurship, so who are founding a startup and trying to think about what a startup project would look like, or other existing partners who already have startups up and running. And um, so far, we've done it in collaboration with the Wade Institute for Entrepreneurship. And so our two groups of students are, have been collaborating together to figure out solutions that improve a project and a startup. So our students, as anthropologists, they go around, they talk to people, uh, they do user research sometimes. Sometimes it's research about strategic thinking that help entrepreneurs think about what are the social impact, what kind of social issues does their problem solve. Mm. And, you know, it, it sounds simple to do, but when you are an entrepreneur and you're founding a startup, you're immersed into this world that moves very fast. You're worrying about funding, you're worrying about marketing, you're worrying about, am I getting screwed with this equity deal? And so often, you know, the, the users, the people who are actually engaging with your product become sort of an afterthought because you're so convinced of the beauty of what you do. It's like, this is right, you know, I'm doing it, I'm spending all this time on it. And you maybe lose sight of the fact that there are twists or changes or twi you know things that you could do differently because people might react to this differently. So, the, one of the examples, for instance, Netflix. Netflix started out as a as a rental DVD company and a little bit like blockbusters, just they would send it to you at home. And at some point, they realized that maybe they wanted to switch their business model and they hired anthropologists to look at how people actually watched movies and what kind of relationship they had, how, how did it matter in their lives. And anthropologists, after a long study, came back and they said, we have found nothing, nothing useful. The only thing we found was that people actually tend to binge watch stuff and then they feel bad about it. And Netflix exactly went like, bling, you know, really? <laughs> and suddenly they just uh, started releasing series all at once. And it became a streaming service that you know everybody started embracing because of that sort of addictive component to having all the series all at once as opposed to one every every week or something yeah, like that. That's so funny. We found nothing useful, just the crux of your new business model. <laughs> exactly. Oh. So obviously, you know, it's not just anthropologists who did that, it's probably a combination of team effort of other people, but mm. having that sort of insights into how people really feel about a certain product or idea or project is really crucial for any new business. Yeah, this is, I'm so, I'm glad you've brought that up because you've almost just gotten to the first question I want to ask. I had a few more great cheesy icebreakers, which I'm sad I won't be able to use now. But <laughs> one of the first questions I actually had was, why do you think anthropology is important? And this is actually a question of what is anthropology? Because the study of people, if you want to take like the, dictionary definition is incredibly uh, broad. I think a lot of people are very confused with what it means. This is something that's particularly pertinent to say the people I'm trying to serve because as young people, we know now that young people want meaning more than anything else in the workplace. And going to university often feels like a tug of war between what's practical and what you're passionate about. And I feel like the moment someone sees a title like diplomat, soldier, spy, the deep state. It's like, what? This is so far apart from like my other random how to market better <laughs> classes. So yeah. 
Yeah. Um, how do you understand what anthropology is? Look, I think for me personally, anthropology was a way to marry a career with something I was passionate about. So really trying to find something meaningful to do that also allowed me to have a future and an income and something that, you know, was practical at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, you can think about anthropology as the ability of understanding the world around you and through people. And so you're really trying to say, look, the economy, the state, uh, the deep state, you know, all of these are, are things that exist, are material, are out there, but they're also constructs of people's attitudes and they're constructs of people's culture and they're also made of people, right? So if we understand people, we're able to understand those other broader processes and we can intervene and interact with them. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, the reason why anthropologists today is particularly useful is that an increasing number of um, customers and you know companies and even public services are trying to understand the people that they are dealing with their customers or their own internal employees and they realize that you know just doing a survey it won't do it because a survey doesn't give you enough information it gives you some information but you probably need other kind of more deep understanding of relationship and people's imaginations or dreams or aspirations so that's where anthropology really becomes not only something that you can be passionate about, you know, doing some kind of adventure somewhere, which is typically how people get drawn to anthropology, the ability of going to a faraway place and yes. discover something, you know, that nobody else has seen maybe. Mm. Uh, but today, increasingly that capacity, that skill becomes useful also for um, trying to find a job, um, even within, you know, things like consultancies or the public sector or NGOs where they're looking at people with those specific research skills and abilities to understand and provide insights based on, on human-centered, if you want, mm. understandings of the world. Yeah, such a fantastic answer. There's so much I want to dig into there. And one question that I'm going to pin for later is you would talk, I would love to talk a bit about success stories from mm -hmm. anthropology. But I'm going to pin that for now because I just want to get a bit more of an understanding of um, the subject. Really, there's actually only two questions in this entire interview. The first is what is anthropology as a subject or discipline? And the second is what is it as a career? So we're still yeah. in part one here. Um, Sounds I to ask, yeah, um, very structured. Um, I wanted to ask you, uh, what do you view as the most important principles of anthropology? If you had to deconstruct it, right, into its building blocks, what would the foundation be? I would say two, maybe three things. One is be curious. And so a principle that guides all of us is to really be curious about things that we take for granted, but we, we realize that actually might look very differently in practice. And so I don't know if you ever hear about, you know, politicians and media talking about corruption, for instance. And... <laughs> You know, coming from Italy, that's something that is very painful for many of us who feel that their perspectives are, are, are hard to reach because of corruption. And so it's, it's something very both personal and like infuriating, really. Mm -hmm. But if, as you are, you are an anthropologist, you might be thinking about how corruption is more complicated. And so you could think about, well, is corruption very different from lobbying, for instance, or are those the same things? And is corruption maybe a way in which you, you try to um, distribute resources at a moment of crisis or in places where there isn't enough? So then you start thinking about, about well, who is doing these things called corruption? How is it, you know, really practiced? And you realize that in some cases, it's actually a way to avoid things like market forces from dominating the country, right? So you have networks of people coming together to keep out other forces that may be more destructive. And, you know, there's, you can make argument about whether corruption is better than uh, pure neoliberal markets or not. But the point is, you don't take for granted the idea that corruption is necessarily bad for everybody everywhere, right? You try to think about what does it mean for people who actually do it and why do they do it and and whose fault if you want is it you know is it people's uh own you know bad nature if you want or is it something else that is pushing people to do certain things in certain circumstances mm -hmm. so being curious and not taking things for granted is number one i think mm -hmm. uh, in the past really it meant being curious also about people who had a completely different livelihood compared to ours and so mm -hmm. 
typically anthropologists went to places where there were tribes or groups of remote populations who believed in completely different you know entities or ways of being compared to us today we can do the same on our own cultures or different cultures that we have mm. number two i would say um anthropologists tend to have an eye for the little guys if you want and so i think you know there's people like me who are doing research at different levels and so both with very powerful financial analysts or you know uh, state actors or entrepreneurs but also then with construction workers and historically at least anthropology is a discipline that is very attentive to people who are marginalized and who are members who don't have really a, a voice to speak with in the public domain and so a lot of what anthropologists find very uh, rewarding is the ability of collecting those voices and giving it a, a space in a public discussion. Mm -hmm. um, and then possibly, you know, the third principle of anthropology is trying to do no harm in the world. And that's a, it's an ethical principle. Mm. It's the idea that, um, you know, you, you should discover something and maybe as a, as a researcher, that's what you do, but you should also think about what you leave behind. Mm. And so you, you're not just there to extract knowledge. You're not just there to create a new exciting theory, but you're there to, to propose something that, you know, at least does no harm, but possibly does something positive for the world. Mm. I think those are the three guiding principles within anthropology that everybody really declines in different senses. Some people look more at culture. Some other anthropologists think more about the material structures that regulate our lives. Mm. Some people are in tune with political issues. Others look at medical anthropology. Yep. Um, there is a lot of talk about that, especially now because of COVID and thinking about you know, how is it that all this new research is going to change our lives? Mm -hmm. There's various domains in which anthropologists apply those principles, but I would say those are the three key elements. Yeah, yeah. Something I'd like to pull out a bit there is you talked about uh, this, this being curious as like a staple. And you, it's, um, I, I recall you were taught it was about how looking at the places, it's like this, it's almost a prompt like, you know, what if I did the opposite or looking where other people aren't looking. So entrepreneurship is uh, uh, you know like the blue ocean red ocean kind of theory which is you always mm -hmm. want to find us you don't you, you don't want to kevin kelly says you don't want to be the best you want to be the only like the only mm -hmm. person who could do this so um drawing on some of your knowledge of the <laughs> anthropological entrepreneurship space as well how can people who are looking to take their anthropology knowledge and they want to start some kind of business or project or change culture in some impactful way how can they marry these two skills look i think what we do as anthropologists is a is a lot of thinking and researching um as you said in in where other people haven't looked at necessarily or or rethinking things that people have assumed taken for granted is and that's really something that entre entrepreneurs do a lot of because they are starting to think about how is it that this one product could work or or, you know, huh, I see a problem there. I see that people are all, you know, using specific kinds of tools to, I don't know, wrap meats overnight, right? They all use these plastic wraps. Mm -hmm. But that sounds very wasteful. You know, what if we did something different with it? Mm -hmm. What if we created a reusable product that could be used for and adapted to different markets? Um, so there's ways in which people are really trying to rethink solutions to problems. And at least in the ideation phase where they're trying to come up with different op 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 options and opportunities, that's where anthropologists really become very important. Mm -hmm. And recently, um, I was just uh, browsing for some of my, I, as you know, I'm doing this research also on entrepreneurs mm -hmm. and I am uh, leading a team of about four uh, researchers here in Melbourne, a few others internationally. And so we were discussing about opportunities of collaboration and I just came across this call for um, anthropologists actually uh, by the UNDP, the United Nations Development Program. Mm -hmm. And they are creating a network of innovation labs essentially that is um, startup accelerators across the globe. Mm. And um, they want specifically anthropologists as part of their 
um, teams. And so they are hiring in, you know, 60 countries or 30 countries um, for different positions where they want to create new accelerator programs. Mm. And um, one of the figures that they want is specifically anthropologists. And so I think that's, that's a testament to how, you know, important that is. And they call this figure head of solution mapping. And so that's what they want anthropologists for, to map solutions and figure out different approaches to the world. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> that's a good bit of, that's a good bit of proof in the pudding there. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's so fascinating that now, because when you talked about anthropologists of the past, uh, representing these like far more, um, sometimes even not even thought about groups. That's where, where I think of a lot of more like famous anthropologists, yep. um, doing the say African-American studies or the people who would go out to, um, the distant places. And now, um, when you talk about looking at the groups within our current society and how they may be underserved, how has the role of the modern anthropologist changed and where do you predict it's going to go in the future? Yeah. Look, I think it's, um, it has moved from being a study of different cultures to a study of, you know, cultures within cultures and, a much more um, segmented understanding of different classes, uh, you know, gendered and, you know, ethnic perspectives on very familiar issues. And so even today, um, there are, you know, in the Victorian government, one of the things they want to do is want to understand how Melbourne is a livable city. Mm -hmm. And what even in the public sector, they're very keenly aware of is the fact that it's not the same city for everybody, right? So if you are somebody living in Kew, uh, maybe coming from an affluent and wealthy family, your experience of the city is very different compared to an international student, mm -hmm. compared to somebody from North Macedonia living in the inner north suburb, or somebody living, you know, in sunshine or somebody somewhere much further away. So depending on your background, your experience of a city is completely different. And so I think increasingly uh, policymakers, companies are becoming more aware of the fact that we need this sort of granular understanding of, of the world around us. Mm. And that means that increasingly, you know, with issues of automation, with issues of changing our contemporary world, understanding how we can interface with that, what that will do to us will become particularly important. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't know if we'll ever see self-driving cars, um, but definitely in places like self-driving cars, self-driving, you know, technologies, having anthropologists look at those um, products, look at how they impact our lives, mm -hmm. that's really important. And I have a few colleagues um, at Monash, um, elsewhere as well, who have been specifically studying automated processes. I myself have been involved or, you know, and I hope to expand on the study of uh, algorithms and how they impact um, you know, various aspects of our lives, including uh, social media. And so it's, it's one of those things where we'll continuously create new technologies that are shaping the world around us. And, but we don't always understand how they actually affect us as people. We, we know how they affect some technical processes, but we then don't always understand what does that mean for us as social lives and groups and people who live together. Yeah, fascinating. And again, you're working in such a interesting time, right? Where not only mm -hmm. have you got this... Uh, worldwide socioeconomic change because of corona but you also have the advent of you know well you're living in the same era as a, a mr elon musk who's going on about within five ten years we'll have Neuralink and he's all all of this information right so this is something that i'm so curious about it seems like when you are an anthropologist you study such huge topics they're, they're so impactful it almost feels like I used to find it hard to study for Diplomat Soldier Spy because I would study for it, right? And I'd be just like, oh my God, there's so much to think about. How are the algorithm? <laughs> like, you know, because you go from like China to then what's happening across the world in Africa. And it's like, suddenly, like whatever the hell else I was studying, like it feels like, what on earth is this? <laughs> Aren't you paying attention? But at the same time, like you said, most of the work is in these research processes. So 
how can anthropologists or people with a passion for anthropology go from studying impactful things to how to actually make an impact? I think that's a hard question for everybody, not just for anthropologists. And the reason for it is, you know, sometimes you think if you know how to code, then you can have an impact. But really, a lot of coding ends up being this very repetitive and, and you know, manual thing. And so you sometimes think, man, I thought that by being a, you know, an engineer, system engineer, I would be able to, I don't know, project the new or do the new satellites. But actually, all I do is, you know, like put together two very small components. And sometimes the truth, that is true also for anthropologists. You come out of it, you think, oh, I'm going to be able to shape the world. And you realize that shaping the world is actually very complex. And so, you know, it, it just, we all want to change it for the better, but, you know, it's to get there, it, it takes a while, right? More than four years. So <laughs> that's right. <laughs> exactly. Um, and I was having this conversation uh, few days ago with somebody who's creating a platform for telling the stories of women who suffered domestic violence. And she says, she's an entrepreneur, but what she's resisting is the idea that she can create a product that can solve everything. Because if there was a silver bullet for domestic violence, then there would be, you know, it would be solved by now. And so yeah. I think the first thing to understand is it's going to take a little bit of time. And everybody needs to be comfortable with their own way of doing things. And so some people might feel that the best way to do it is by going into advocacy kind of role. And so a lot of our students tend to work in places like NGOs where they do maybe research on the field for them or, you know, help them understand specific problems in, say, Africa. Mm -hmm. And if you have been in my class, you've seen some of the questions around, you know, malaria prevention and immunization prevention. Mm -hmm. Now, those questions are sometimes thrown around in, in economic terms, which one is the most effective and most cost effective. But when you look at it from the perspective of the people who are going through it, you often have a completely different way of understanding the problem, right? And so often having anthropologists in this role is a very effective way to think about what, how can we make those lives better without only worrying about how much it costs, but worrying actually about the impact on the community there. So that's one route that people always find very useful. Mm -hmm. But increasingly, folks are finding that there is opportunities for shaping things also in private companies and in, in domestic governments as well. Mm -hmm. So you have uh, folks that I work with and that often come to my um, design anthropology class that are coming from an anthropology background working with consultancies or working with various kinds of companies um, that have been working with Intel, they have been working with Google or Facebook. Um, some of them work with this company called uh, Forethought here in Melbourne or another one called Paper Giant. Mm -hmm. And what they do essentially is that they help businesses see the perspective of their users and clients to change the culture of the business itself. And so they might be doing sometimes very specific studies about one product and how people react to that product, or how different kinds of people think about that one product. Mm -hmm. But also they might be asked, helping businesses rethink their own strategies, rethink their own culture, rethink how their business model should be articulated. Mm -hmm. And so those are just some of the ways in which they, you know, people try to make an impact in the world coming out of anthropology. Yeah, yeah. It reminds me a lot. Do you know um, Seth Godin's work? Sorry? Do you know Seth Godin's work? Um, yes, a little bit. Yeah, yeah. So I'm a big Seth Godin fan. And he's, a, he's a marketer. But mm -hmm. what he talks about a lot is this idea of when you're doing marketing, what you're doing is you are seeking to change culture. You're, since you're seeking to create tension and then relieve it. And it reminds me a lot of... Um, he also talks a lot about the empathy to understand that it isn't actually you who you're serving because you're always trying to serve somebody else. It seems to me like there, there's certainly an overlap there between this modern anthropology and these, I guess you call it marketing, right? Um, but yeah. the, the question I wanted to ask there was, so we cater more towards these students who are trying to go get them, like the probably closer to the entrepreneur types. Where would you like to see the attention of students who are, you know, have an anthropological 
care for culture sense, but they also have this really, hey, I do actually want to start things, go get them, everything. Where do you think there needs to be more attention? This could be in private sectors. It could even be in like social issues. It's like, where do you see underserved opportunities? I think there is two places where that can be really, really effective. One is in government. And um, in government, we tend to have people who are thinking of policy only. But increasingly, designing policy is becoming human-centered. And so the governments are trying to figure out how can we design better policies that are not top-down but bottom-up or they have at least an understanding of what people are looking at and what they think about specific issues. So that's, uh, I think, an important opportunity. Not everybody is aware of that, but increasingly that becomes a winning card if you can, if you can bring up those, issues, those perspectives and those trainings um, in interviews, for instance. Okay. Then the second aspect is there is a whole set of um, companies and, and consultancies that are thinking about these issues and they are often struggling to articulate they're like well we would want to do something innovative we don't quite know what it is mm -hmm. we know we want somebody that works in that space and so if you are you know if you know how to play your cards you can definitely use that to your advantage and say hey I have a background I've, I've been part of this class on design anthropology I've been doing research with startups I have all this understanding of how the business world works but I also understand people and I am a good communicator I have empathy I've devised all the skills that allow me to actually you know be in tune with the world around me and that's really key I think for a lot of places and I think you know this is maybe a bit of a career advice but there is a lot of positions where the important and key element is to be a smart uh, flexible and and you know curious person right mm -hmm. I mean we as universities we provide with important skills, ways of looking at the world differently and critically. Mm -hmm. And critical thinking is, as a matter of fact, not in huge supply out there, right? <laughs> and so the problem is that often businesses who are trying to do things a little bit different, they find themselves with people who are coming out of some certain, you know, maybe business schools and everything. They are yeah. very, you know, standardized in how they see the world. Yeah. And they don't need that. They need people who are able to think differently. This is, this is so important. So on that author again, Seth Godin, his second last book was called Lynchpin. And it was all about how it's no longer enough to be able to be like, if we can describe your job, we can find some way to do it cheaper. And you're not going to out obedience to competition. So what we need now is people who are irreplaceable in the perspectives they bring or in the, the ways in which they understand culture. It's why um, when I was doing research for this, again, like I said in the email, anthropology is such an interesting subject because I think so many students love the idea of it, but they're like, what do I tell my parents? <laughs> um, I just, I mean this in the sense of they're worried because yeah. you really don't hear a lot about working anthropologists. In fact, where I heard it, because my background is mostly along this more business side, one of the first working anthropologist I heard about was uh, Simon Sinek. So mm -hmm. he does um, really, really popular like leadership theory, probably has one of the best speeches on impact theory, I think. He wrote The Golden Circle and everything. And his background was in anthropology. And when he explained in an interview, he was asking about, you know, oh, how does this serve you? He was saying, well, anthropology is studying cultures and I go in and change workplace cultures. I was like, that sounds perfectly applicable. I can't, I'm struggling to understand why, why it doesn't seem like there are more anthropologists out there really doing all this. I would think they would be like spearheading the charge in some sense. Um, I think it's because a lot of us um, found the business world a little bit, um, you know, ethically complicated. And, and the reason is that, you know, when you're working in a company, one, you often don't have a lot of decision power because you end up, you know, unless you're really one of the top bosses, mm. um, it's hard to, to do that kind of deep change that anthropologists would want to see. And so, you know, and, and you're serving a private entity that often has to 
compete in the global world. So by definition has to, to create forms of inequality. So for a lot of people, it's, it's been like, I don't want to be part of that. Yeah. But the problem that we are seeing today is that there is increasingly less spaces for doing something completely different, right? So it's, it's like, okay, you don't want to do that, but what, what can you do instead? And I'm thinking about this issue in terms of it's not a perfect solution if you are completely, you know, socially minded and want to, you know, and you want to fight inequality. Mm. Um, yes, it's not ideal to be working in a in a private company because that's not what they are there for. They are there to create profit. But on the other hand, maybe there's things you can do in that space that make um, working conditions, they make uh, products, they make um, these kinds of processes a little bit better for the people who use them, for the people who are part of it. Mm. So it's a, it's a different way of thinking about how you can create a positive impact, even within those structures. And I think it's important today because it's increasingly hard not to be part of that world. I mean, mm. it's, you know, there's very few jobs in academia. There's very few jobs in other spaces um and so you know if we can bring positive change within those organizations i think that's a win it's maybe not a big win but it's still a win you know and so i think it's we will take we should take it if you can <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah 100 percent. it's this exact topic is well this exact pull push right of you know the private company who wants to um whose goal really like you have to make profit to stay up right but then also the desire of many people to make a difference that doesn't that leaves the world better than you found it it's it's something that uh it'd be real nice if there was a silver bullet for this one because i think that for a while that's been what people have been trending towards trying to do uh, as in i just see more and more uh, companies who are really trying to be more socially conscious, uh, making more efforts towards reducing, um, well, trying to reduce inequality as much as possible. One of the the funnier examples is somebody like a like an Apple type, in that you know they took initiatives to try and uh, make like thirty percent of their phones made of like recycled materials, but at the same time had some of the worst working conditions ever in their factories, but. Jeez, I'm really, I, maybe I'm an optimist, but I'm so like, I, I want to be able to see organizations spring up that are from the bottom up focused on positive social change, even though this is. Yeah. <laughs> it's hard to do, but look, I mean, it's hard to do regardless of where you are, you know? And so I think the important element that anthropology teaches you is that you can still be curious, you can still try to do the right thing in a number of different endeavors. And, you know, you don't, you shouldn't expect to have immediate results, but you can still try. And I think that's the key yes. message. And, and you, you have a series of tools that can allow you to work in different sectors. And, you know, in some, we all have to live out of something, right? And so mm -hmm. even in the university sector, which we would say it's probably one of the least affected by some of these dynamics we have terrible problems you know we have 70 percent of the workforce that is casuals that are not recognized as real workers and, yeah, and we depend on them and they are you know so it's not like it's an ideal place either but we try to do what we can to make it better and i think that's a key point you know to maintain that optimism maintain that curiosity maintain that ethical approach mm. and unlike other um disciplines anthropologists teaches you not to lose those elements and teaches you to use them for the better and i don't know i mean to me it's very powerful um regardless of what you decide to do with it it becomes something that you know you have within you as a, as a tool as a skill to push forward yeah um yeah it's it's such a it's a dream that would be lovely if more people really strive for it so with that, with everything you just said in mind, this, this, this goal that we have to try and make it better, which really is, um, I genuinely think is essential to the world. I think one of the most depressing things you can see is these young people who have already given up in a sense, and they're just so overtaken by the world. It really is tragic. I'm amazed at how much nihilism there is in um, university outside of philosophy classes. It's, it's insane. So with that in mind, 
what advice would you give to a, a smart, driven university student? They want to make a difference and they're about to enter the dreaded real world. <laughs> like three things. One, read Nietzsche. And the reason for it is because he is, you know, it's one of his nihilists, if you want, but he says that there is a, 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 a the, the tunnel ends, if you want. So he has this famous three stages in, in Das Spokes Zaratustra. First, he says, you're like a camel, you bear everything, then you become like a dragon, you destroy the world around you and try to rebel. And then third, you become like a, a child and you start yeah. creating a world according to your own thinking, according to a new way of thinking. So I think in doing that, anthropology is really important because it allows you to really think like a child. It's like, okay, what if we did this differently? What if we did that? So I would encourage everybody not to lose that sort of childish um, capacity to create things. Mm that's the first it's like an attitude you know don't don't give up um in that in that you accept the world as it is just think that everybody can be different if they want to and i think this is something that everybody has it's just that some folks have been just so battered by what's around them that they just have, have lost the strength to to realize that curiosity but i think everybody like every time i talk to students no matter how hard their circumstances might be i find that kind of lingering sparkles within them and so i'm really amazed by the by the great capacity our students have to see the world differently yes and um that's number one number two you know draw uh, draw on your networks of both lecturers and tutors mm -hmm. and people that you've met through university mm -hmm. because those are your number one resource mm. again as anthropologists we teach people that you know the world is not made of of algorithms i mean it is made of algorithms but it's also made of people right? <laughs> oh we are in a simulation ah oh, finally <laughs> i've been wondering <laughs> <about that. laughs> so the world is made of people and those people are often very keen on helping you mm. and that's something that i've learned you know you said that i moved country to country and every time it was a new beginning it was just so difficult and so hard to move across right and and when we moved back to the u.s at some point after i did a year of research in macedonia it was both me and my wife and um i thought it was going to be both very easy to step into this new world but turns out that she had um that the visa that she had didn't allow her to work and nobody at that time wanted to sponsor new visas right because it was just too complicated and so the way we got around that was by continuously talking to people reaching out to networks of you know alumni of the various universities of people who we had connections with and drawing on folks and asking them hey you know this is what i'm thinking about what do you think you know i'm i'm trying to do this thing what do you think and today I find it that that really gave me a different perspective on not just help me to reach something, but also help me understand how asking for help and drawing on people really creates connection. Because if somebody takes a coffee with you, you know, then sometimes they're thinking, huh, I want to help this person further. And, and that creates a relationship with, with those people, some of which are, are really amazing friends up to these days. Yes. So that's number two thing. Number three thing is, you know, there is uh, a tendency for people to get very uh, discouraged by the application process, for instance, or by the fact that there is a stone wall between you and where you want to go at. And so I would encourage people to look at what, um, you know, at, and one ask themselves, is that something that I really like, right, in practice? And so when you talk to people that are maybe already in that position, and say that you want to, you think you want to be an investment banker, right? Well, before spending, I don't know, five months into, you know, building the connections and applying for jobs, maybe have a chat with somebody who already is an investment banker yes. and ask them very honestly, yeah. what is that you do every day? Like what is physically, you know, you go to work and then what happens? Yeah. Because you might think that you want to do something, but when you actually look at what it is in practice, yeah. It's maybe not for you, you know, maybe that's oh, yeah. not something that you <laughs> truly want. Yeah, this, this is the, um, this reminds me so much of like the story Jung told about the, the issue with like so many modern people is that they spend their whole lives chasing this dream. He gives the example of like the fisherman who believes that, you know, he'll go out and after he's acquired his skills, he'll go out and fish, right? He'll be able to retire to his fishing thing and he'll be just be pulling in fish all the time and he'll He'll love it, have this relaxed life. And he gets there 
He does that for a week and it's good. And then the week after that, he hates it. And the reason why is because at this point, he thought he'd be catching mermaids. <laughs> he, hasn't, he, hasn't been, he hasn't put in the work to actually live this kind of life. He hasn't tested it. He never asked somebody. So yeah, that's so important. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, really quick. I'd love to ask a few more questions, but also I really have to actually go to the bathroom. Do you mind if we take a very short break? And Not worries about it. Reconvene in two, three minutes? Yep. No worries. Perfect. I'll be back very soon. And we're back. Um, so yeah, well, where are we? Well, oh yeah. So, um, so I've just got two things I definitely want to note on there. The first one is I'm so happy you brought up Nietzsche, funnily enough. Um, and I was searching before. Uh, I've got my, my little bookshelf here, but um, it, it's, not, it's not quite up here. I have the, the book Will to Power. I actually love that book and it's so interesting how you know aside from the fact they got used by the nazis that kind of sucked but outside of that it was the um it's so fascinating how Nietzsche takes this perspective of hey we we have to become our own gods if you destroy these institutional structures then we have to become for ourselves these in, these meaning generating machines effectively so i'm very happy you brought that up um, the other question I had following from what you were speaking about before was how can we as students, before we enter uh, into organizations and whatnot, how can we practice making a difference? How can we practice anthropology in meaningful and impactful ways, you know, before we get hired by the UN or whatever? <laughs> A few ideas. One, we have a few classes that allow students to practice um, these kinds of skills. And so one is mine. Um, uh, we changed the title. I think this, sem this semester, next semester is going to be called Design, Innovation and Society. Mm -hmm. It's uh, ANTH 30019 anyways. And so that's the one where we do collaboration with startups. Um, there is another subject called The Secret Life of Students, I believe, which is um, yeah. a research based on understanding how students lives are complicated and complex and so allows you to do practical research in that kind of sphere mm. so those are two practice based subjects that you can take as part of your curriculum to learn more about how to develop those skills mm. there is another way you can get engaged and start practicing uh, skills that are anthropological in nature and that is by joining some of the clubs that work on things like entrepreneurship or uh, you know similar issues and you can use those opportunities to start practicing and seeing whether those kinds of environments are for you mm -hmm. and then finally there is often opportunities for volunteering that uh, you know some of your um subject coordinators or other people around have in mind or inter, you know internships that are both in the private and in the public sector they might be able to direct you to the right kinds of things and so i think there is an opportunity for everybody to take internships and i really really strongly recommend that you look into that you know ahead of time so that you have an opportunity to think about what is that could be an interesting space for me to experiment with it doesn't have to be the perfect internship but you could try something that is maybe you know cu you're curious about and you want to see hey how would it work if i tried in an ngo how would it work you know i'm typically yeah. somebody oriented towards marketing but what it would look like if i tried a completely different environment mm -hmm. i think that is often a very useful type of experience that you can enlist um i have a few students who have after taking my class design anthropology have uh, tried internships in the private sector with consultancies one of them both of them then got offered positions um one of them loved it one of them didn't love it and so decided to then step back from it and so yeah. well, that's okay that's just part of of, of life you know <laughs> yeah i'm glad this has come out and it's a theme I hear so much. I feel like if there is one thing that I would try to at least teach uh, students is that the importance of going out there and trying and discovering, even when you talk about the curiosity that's necessary as an anthropologist, these opportunities like uh, exploring different clubs and doing research projects and uh, doing internships, it's, I feel like in our modern world especially at a modern university it's such an important skill to know that hey you have to go get these opportunities yourself 
in that, um, well, I actually made a video a while back called The Candy House of University. And what that was about was that was about it's not enough nowadays to just have this degree. And what I feel increasingly, and this is strongly my opinion, that universities have to become spaces where people can practice real world skills and get access to, like you said, lecturers, tutors, and a network of opportunity. Because maybe 50 years ago, when less than 12% of the population had a degree, it was super valuable. But now, um, especially with online education becoming so prominent, you really have to go out there and uh, experiment for yourself. So I'm very happy that's come up. I was speaking yeah, of I think it's something that is not, you know, unfortunately, some of our lectures are still based on the kind of lecture and tutorial uh, structure where uh, students don't have really a lot of access to, you know, lectures like myself. And in fact, it's very rare that somebody take initiative like you and say, hey, can we have a chat about X and Y? And I don't know if you remember, I, I organized a couple of, um, uh, you know, kind of hours to discuss with students yeah. and there was very few people who showed up. So, you know, lucky them, they got to talk to me for, you know, a while about whatever they wanted to. Mm -hmm. But the point is that those are opportunities for folks to build relationships and, and then tomorrow, maybe, you know, in six months or whenever you're maybe finding or you wanted to get an internship somewhere like, hey, you know, Fabio, you know, I was in that class. Could you write me a recommendation letter? Could you, you know, do you have, do you know anybody in this space that could help me? And, you know, I, at least I am very happy to make some connections, but I think most of my colleagues are as well. So we are trying, I think, within the university to change the model. Mm -hmm. In my design anthropology class, it's much more collaborative. There's no like lecture two, it's is all um, one and present everywhere. Mm -hmm. But, you know, and everybody and other people are trying to do the same as well. Mm -hmm. But it's also on you to try as students to try and do the most out of this amazing institution. I mean, there are so much people doing so many things at the University of Melbourne mm -hmm. that I think everybody can find something that they are too passionate about and draw on those connections to mm -hmm. build um, something that they find both meaningful and practical. Perfect, perfect. Yeah, I've got a, I've got a message then to give to the people. Hear that? Bother your university teachers. Agreed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's th that's basically essentially what um i'm trying to do in terms of i I've, i was trying to think how can i contribute to people and i figured well i'm in a university you may as well try and bother the teachers to see if we can get perspective as to what it's like within their worlds okay um a question that i was actually meant to ask um back before when you were speaking about hey if you want to be an investment banker maybe speak to someone who's in investment banking see what yeah. it's like but now directed at you, what's your day to day like working as an anthropologist? Well, uh, when you work as an anthropologist in the university sector, um, you typically end up fitting within the kind of strange nine to five, but also 24 seven life of an academic. Uh -oh. <laughs> so it is a strange um, timeline. Oh. It's, I'm saying nine, nine to five because typically on campus activities happen nine to five. Although increasingly there is a tendency to try to accommodate other hour slot for teaching. So some people might be teaching me very on weekends. I mean, I had a few years back when I was in New York, I used to teach on Fridays and Sa Friday, Saturday and Sunday. So it was, you know, you can be teaching at any time. Let's put it that way. <laughs> but uh, what is maybe most uh, strange about academic life is that you don't have an office standard, you know, relationship. And so, you may be in and out of the office at different time of the day because you maybe have meetings. Mm -hmm. So today, if we were able to travel around, I would be probably at my office up until, you know, um, 11.30 or something. And then I would be heading downtown where I have a meeting for research purposes with one of the entrepreneurs I'm working with. Mm -hmm. And then I would have a union meeting. And so I would probably travel somewhere else. And then in the afternoon, I'll be like, uh-oh, I haven't done any research or, you know, prepared any of my lecture today. So I guess no going out for a pub tonight. Oh. <laughs> yeah, more like, well, typically on Fridays, we would have a, a drink with colleagues. But, you know, then after the drink, you typically go home and you start preparing the lecture. or <laughs> You start reading about that paper you need to finish. So yeah. it's a strange kind of everyday because you're – you're doing all sorts of different things, but the positive thing about it is that it's not it's not like I'm going there at nine, starting five something and I finish at five and that's the end of it. Mm. Your day is really 
uh, eclectic in that sense. Yeah. And that's when you are in the university. When you are doing research, it becomes very different. You're often on your own. You're, you know, you're doing something very specific for a certain period of time. In, in my case, in Macedonia. And so in that case, I was waking up much earlier, going on field sites and construction sites, hanging out with workers there, and maybe in the afternoon, catching up with people in, in you know, doing interviews in, in the city. Mm. And then you need to write your notes. And then often at night, there is events that happen. And then you're like there again. So it's very, it depends on the kinds of environment in which you're doing research. Yeah, yeah. So um, something I think a lot of people will find attractive about uh, the prospect of a career as an anthropologist is this idea of worldwide travel. Yeah. Um, um, I, what is, uh, <laughs> how do you do that? So how would, how would one get, I guess, paid or funded to travel around the world and study interesting um, cultures? As awful as that sounds. No, it sounds You're good. typically okay. trying to become an expert in an area. And so you, for a number of reasons, sometimes because of your background, sometimes because of your language skills, sometimes because of what you've been backpacking that one time, you try to then specialize in <laughs> one area. I've met a whole bunch of apologists. <laughs> Just, I thought they were. Well, Sometimes that's how it starts. Sometimes you know you've yeah. gone somewhere, you've found something very strange, you've become involved with people there that are doing something that you didn't expect, and then suddenly you pitch this idea to maybe your supervisors or your you know, lecturers or somebody, and and they are like, well, I think that's you know that could be a project, and then you start with doing maybe an honors project that's that typically doesn't require you to travel because it's very complicated, but still gives you some skills and then you maybe do a master's or a PhD where you do some field work overseas uh, based on those experiences and connection. Then you learn the language and typically that's how you then move forward in doing other things. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it depends a bit on where you are. If you are in private companies, the time for doing research is much smaller. Mm -hmm. uh, we use typically six, three to 12 months for research periods. And we try to just have a block of time when you just do research. Mm. Um, in private companies, of course, it's much more complicated. So my colleagues who are working for consultancies, they do field work, but they do maybe one week or, or you know, two weeks. And then that's it. They need to then produce results. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fascinating life. It is, it is certainly not the... Um, Certainly not the programmed kind of nine to five <laughs> admin yeah. entry, which is, I think, a big uh, plus, big plus. Um, just one, I don't really have a, one or two more questions, but one more on the career side. What are some success stories of people coming out of anthropology that you know of? Well, um, a colleague of mine is now working for an important consultancy in London and she is traveling the world doing research on uh, airports and among other things and so it's a it's very interesting life there uh, there's of course a, an anthropologist who headed the World Bank so that's uh, that's also something that uh, you know, you <laughs> be aspiring that. or being the president of Afghanistan for instance so you know you, you can have an anthropologist in a very florid and interesting career it doesn't um, doom you to oh just <laughs> regular <laughs> anthropology work you can become a, a what, wait, what was it the, the did you say a president of did i hear turkmenistan i think i heard it wrong of afghanistan afghanistan okay i was like i didn't know um, <laughs> mr bergen bully was a um, anthropologist yeah and um there is other anthropologists that i know that are part of they are working within companies like google's uh or or you know facebook um and i've risen to very prominent positions and uh, there's anthropologists um that are now within the government even victorian government or other uh, governments and have uh, very senior positions there um, so it really depends. I think it's one of those careers that allow you to, or, or it's one of those skill sets and disciplines that allow you to then choose what you want to focus on. Um, yeah. One of the, my favorite anthropologists, um, 
in terms of examples of how much impact you can have is Paul Farmer, who is both, I think, a medical doctor and an anthropologist. And he has been involved in all sorts of immunization and, uh, you know, poverty reduction and public health campaign across the world, especially with tuberculosis um, trials and preventions and vaccination. Um, so it's, it's, you know, he's really somebody who has made a lot of impact by raising the awareness and studying how tuberculosis can be a consequence of social relationship and can proliferate in things like prison, things like, you know, in specific socioeconomic conditions. And, and that has been really making a, a significant impact. So it really, it's really about your skills and your background and, and marrying those two things together. Yeah. It sounds to me like one of the biggest, um, well, supposed benefits of being an anthropologist is being able to be paid to chase your curiosity. Um, I agree. Yeah. So let's say there is somebody and they, they hear this and they're like, that is perfect, but they're impatient and they're thinking, I want to speed run my way to be able to go, um, let's say to like some rural Chinese village and then do some like research there and stuff like that um if they were really if they were like hey i want to do this as fast as possible right um what advice would you give them for how to get there like what qualifications would they ascertain are there any tricks you can tell interviewers to be like hey i really am the um, best for this position do you have any advice on that end two main ones would be one uh get as many classes about either china or um methods and or applied anthropology so take classes that are practical that teaches you um how to do research in practice and then take classes that, that allow you to study chinese culture even if you are already familiar with it um or you know whatever culture you're interested in just just take classes that allow you to deepen that kind of knowledge mm. and then learn the language uh, in whatever mean capacity and possibility you have often those positions and those kinds of jobs and opportunities require you to have some kind of knowledge of the place that you want to work in. Not always, but they, if you can showcase that you know what you, you will be dealing with, it's really a big plus. So go to the movies, watch Chinese movies, you know, with subtitles, without subtitles, yeah. um, you know, older or newer, you know, try to look at all these kinds of in reports and information on his resume it says i've watched ip man one two and three <laughs> yeah it's, it's an excellent thing don't, don't put it in those terms but use them as a reference point for the local country to watch. Um, so do what you can to get in touch with that place mm. and then draw on the networks of unimel of people who have already been there or done something with that organization Mm. and try to figure out to get their advice about how to specifically pitch your skills mm. to that one place and remember you know enlisting others to help you is the best way to to find your own opportunities yes brilliant brilliant uh, I'll, I'll i'll let him know <laughs> so <laughs> yeah i i have one final proper question the others are mostly jokes are, are you still everything's still okay on your end for i I think I might need to go soon, yeah. actually. So maybe I have time for one last question. One last question. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. So let's assume for a second that there was a great library of Alexander like fire, right? And all the books on anthropology are burning. You have to run in and you could only save a handful of books on the subject. Which ones would you save? Well, I would save... Um, one of them is is uh, Sweetness and Power mm -hmm. by Cinnamon. Mm -hmm. It's a story of how sugar became important, um, both in the Caribbean and in England, and uh, oh, yeah. enabled uh, you know. So it's, it follows this commodity along the production route and shows that the social impact in both places. I won't tell you why it's important, otherwise you won't read it. <laughs> yes. um, I would say um, another very important book, which is The Poetics of Manhood, which studies people in Greece who were stealing sheep and, and tells you why is it that these people were stealing each other's sheep? What does it do for them? Um, I, would I would steal probably The Vanishing Hector, which is a book about post-socialist Romania and how 
land became flexible or fuzzy in many ways? And how is it that, that after the restitution from socialism, that land seemed to either disappear in some case or reappear somewhere else? And so nobody quite knew what was happening there. And then I would probably steal my book, um, you know, <laughs> Dark Finance, just because I wrote it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, fair enough, fair enough. Yeah, it's, oh geez, it's almost a shame we didn't get around to all the um, uh, economic and You can read it soon, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a plug. Read Dark Finance, everybody, for the illiquidity issues in the periphery of Europe. Is that the? <laughs> yep, yep. Perfect. Well, that's really everything. Uh, thank you so, so much for the time. 